about the series, how it came to be, and how with the passage of time now looking back, what is it, 26 years, a quarter of a century of practice, uh, how you feel about it? What's changed? What's stayed the same? Um, well, nothing's changed about the way I see the paintings. Uh, it's always nice when you look at a painting that you've done a long time ago and it's as fresh as the day you made it. And that's one of the, the principal tenets of art, that it doesn't get old. It's not like an old photograph. It's not like an old movie. It doesn't have a patina of age. So it's always present, even, say, classical paintings. So they seem to hold their own uh, without aging, without losing their, uh, their meaning without uh, becoming uh, retardier, or uh, the, the sentiments in them are not uh, old-fashioned. So to me, they're just a pleasure to see. And they are true, and it's ongoing. Because the, the main reasons for these pictures is really to show the aspect of, of human beings that's a constant one of, uh, of uh, destruction and uh, one of uh, trying to prevent it. Mm. And I think that uh, you, you really touched on something that's key. Uh, I'm asked quite often, you probably are too, what makes a painting good? Um, or what's a masterpiece? And I think that your point about standing the test of time is exactly the key and that these works have and will continue to, to stand the test of time. Yeah, any work of art, I believe, that's done honestly is uh, going to have some of that. And then the rest is a question of uh, so many uh, influences and so many makeups of the artist. Uh, to, have, to be able to make works that contain that is, uh, I'm always extraordinarily excited to see it. In the context of series, though, can you talk a little bit about how you see the disaster series fitting in with some of the other bodies of work that you're perhaps better known for, at least up until this point, the flowers in particular and the new buttons and things like that? Well, they all contain an element of industrialization. They all contain an element of, uh, of uh, building and fragility and building materials and uh, genetic, generic uh, aspects of food production, of flower production, of, uh, of the ways in which we live with artifice. They all contain certain aspects of that. I haven't really wavered from the fundamental idea. These are also about systems, like I had mentioned before, but systems of, of, uh, of, of the materials themselves, systems of trying to deal with uh, these catastrophic issues, systems of, uh, of uh, redundancy, of architecture. And uh, I do that in the other works as well. So it just keeps extending the language. Uh, smoke rings, for example, uh, are, the idea of that was really to take something that was the most, one of the most, if not the most ephemeral uh, image of smoke and solidify it. And uh, if you think about smoke, that's what uh, reveals light. So if you're in a movie theater and people are smoking, you see the projector uh, light. Exactly, yeah. And uh, one of the reasons that we have such a, a fascination with celebrities is because, uh, uh, like the Greek gods, they appear to us in light. Mm -hmm. As, for, as only light. And when you see someone in reality who's a star, you don't quite grasp the, uh, the stature, so to speak. Yeah. It's sometimes you don't even recognize them. The disconnect. Yeah, so then also uh, the system aspect of it went through the dominoes, it went, um, it went through the buttons, it, went, it goes through everything, the systems of making art. So there's similarities to everything, and uh, the materials some change and morph, but Basically, they're still uh, expanding the language of paint through uh, the use of uh, non-painterly materials. So, Donald, your, your list of 
museum shows is um, quite extensive. Uh, and it means that you've been exhibiting for 40 decades? Probably 40 years. So yeah. you've seen a lot of changes. I know that from, from my chair as a museum administrator, museum director, um, just in the last 20 years, we've seen enormous changes in our field in terms of the shifting emphasis going from being the temple to the agora or the public civic meeting place. And that brings with it, of course, a uh, renewed emphasis or focus on education. And when you combine that with what's happening in the realm of technology, both in terms of the production of art, but also the dissemination and consumption of art, uh, there are a lot of shifts that have occurred and are occurring at uh, an increasingly rapid pace. And I'm wondering how it, how it, have, it, it impacts you, if at all, as, as a producing artist who is interacting with museums uh, that are going through these, these very monumental changes in some cases. Uh, in terms of uh, technology and the way in which I present myself in the world, I'm just getting kind of used to that a little bit. I uh, don't really use a website that much. I do have one. I, uh, I like, uh, I kind of like uh, interviews like this because you get a chance to talk about things that are important to you, and it's interesting to see if you can articulate them on the fly. Yeah. And uh, I uh, had a philosophy teacher who taught me that my Wittgenstein statement that anything can, that is thought can be said clearly. Mm -hmm. So I try to do that. I don't, I'm not really involved in uh, using other media than painting and looking uh, to promote my work, which may be sad. But I really believe that uh, you can only really understand the works by seeing them in real, in reality. And uh, I don't know how people respond to works only by the, the visual, uh, the, 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 the reproduction, for example. I mean, every technological aspect around art and probably everything else, really, except for live television, is a reproduction. So. I love printmaking, but still, even with printmaking, even though that's a reproduction, I think you really only get it by seeing the real print. Sure. So art is a little bit different than, than many other art forms. Art has a, a magic quality to it that doesn't translate that well, as far as I can tell, into, into digital media or to uh, technological use. It's probably good to advance your, your personality but I'm not so sure that's an interest of mine, per se. So you have, a, I, I gather, a very platonic concept of art, you know, the notion of the cave, and with each image or, you know, you get one, one remove further away from the object or the idea, as it were. Well, all art, in one form or another, is produced in a cave. Absolutely. So, I mean, from the earliest art to, to the studios today, I mean, people say, oh, you see this, did you see that? And I say, well, I'm just down here in my cave. <laughs> cave. You know, I'm focused well, on what I'm doing. You're just flashing on the wall, right? So, you know, it's, uh, you, 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 if you're working in painting, you have to be present. And every aspect of it that you do, you have to pay attention to it. Because any little change that you make requires the whole thing to be changed. So I don't have time to go out and put other people's ideas in my head right now. There are times when I go see certain things I want to see. But one of my favorite things was talking to David Hockney. And I saw him at the Met one day. And I went up and I was talking to him. We were looking at uh, Corbet, I think. And uh, I was talking to him and he didn't move. And finally I tapped him and he turned around and he, he nodded. And he turned his uh, <laughs> hearing aids on. He had turned them off so nobody could talk to him or yeah, disturb his so, concentration. Yeah. And in a way, if you're deaf, you can do that. But if you're not, you know, to get your space just to look at pictures is uh, sometimes difficult. Because yeah. the museums are quite crowded. Quite crowded, and also there's a lot of art being made. A there's a lot, lot of art, art that's available for consumption you know, intellectually and, and through your senses. And I think that, um, well, to go back to the Mona Lisa effect, um, sometimes we're just kind of skimming the surface and not really finding the opportunity to go deep. But to go back to, to um, the virtual experience, I think that 
well, I'm obviously a firm believer in needing to come visit art in person. And we here at the Lowe found it fascinating with your show. We dimensioned everything. We had our digital mock-up of the galleries with your paintings dropped in. Everything was great. Um, but what we didn't, what we couldn't feel or sense was the impact. Once these paintings were up, we were all just completely overwhelmed in the best possible sense of the word because you don't, you don't get the facture, you don't get the sense of texture, and you don't have that immersive experience until you're actually standing in front of one of these massive panels. Yeah, and well, that's why I wanted to have these out. P people don't know. Yeah. I mean, for the longest time, I only made paintings this size for a long time, and one foot square. That was it. I never made any other sizes. I made a lot of these paintings. <laughs> and they're all over the place now, but uh, somehow later on I started making, you know, different sizes and you know, to different scales. Those are very difficult to do when you're used to a certain kind of thing. And right. So I was very excited to really um, have this body of work brought to my attention and of course to meet you. Um, because for me it's, it's really exactly the type of work that is so important for the low. So we are the only encyclopedic art museum in Miami. We're also the first art museum founded in 1950 in our region. Uh, and because we, we are so old, relatively speaking, we have a significant collection that is uh, comprehensive and spans 5,000 years through 19,000 objects. Um, but returning to our, our earlier conversation about this, this fervent interest in all things contemporary right now, we're also very mindful of our audience uh, and that interest. So our mission is to explore contemporary culture through 5,000 years of art, which is so exciting when we find an artist like you, and in particular a body of work like the disaster paintings, because they are so rife uh, with, with art historical references uh, to Manet and Goya and Whistler and the 17th century Dutch and Spanish Baroque painters. Um, it's all there. Um, but you, you don't need to know that. You can enjoy them for what they are without going that deep or, or having to, to really start to pick them apart intellectually. So I love that it has the, those two elements, that you can enjoy them on a very aesthetic, sensual level, or you can really spend time picking them apart. When I uh, first started uh, out in New York and I was making work, and suddenly, I guess in 1979 or 80, I've started to become kind of very hot and well-known, and a lot of attention was paid. And the first thing that happened when that happened is I thought, which it was difficult for me, and probably what most people don't do, but which makes their life simpler, I thought, holy cow, now I have to compete with Goya uh. and Rembrandt, and I have to bring my work and be as good as those masters. And I was paralyzed. Yeah. And how yeah. long did you say so you had writer's block, essentially? No, I didn't have any writer's block, but I realized that what I was doing had to be not just, you know, glib or, uh, you know, challenging to art world thoughts, but to be, transcend that into something else. And then that's what I, I began to work on. Transcendent. We go back to this idea of standing the test of time. So how did you, how did you break free of that? Clearly, you know, the log jam didn't last. Uh, I think that I, uh, you know, I looked at enough art and I uh, realized what my place could be and I didn't worry about it anymore because I sort of felt that if I made little still life paintings, which I made one foot square, uh, I was going to be, you know, people would say, what is this like in terms of uh, uh, the great, like Melendez or Cotan or, uh, you know, Velasquez. And uh, I decided that there wasn't any way it would be like that. They'd be new because I did them. Yeah. And they were the same as if they made theirs out of plaster, tar, and linoleum tile. So well that's said. how I overcame it. Well said. Thank you.